Thank you for tuning in to Variety Cards TV and RiderCards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Reno, and today we're going to be talking about day five of the, Na the 2018 National Sports Collectors Convention. Um, real quick, I reviewed the footage from day four and realized that my camera was tilted too far forward, and the uh, the footage was my, basically, like, you can barely see my, you can almost see my eyes and, like, that in my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was late, and I didn't want to re-record it after I reviewed it. Um, and I was also a bit fatigued, and I didn't think to do a test run to <laughs> to see if it turned out before I finally did the finished product. So, apologize for that. I hope that you're still able to enjoy the content and the um, and the, uh, the 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 video of me showcasing the cards. So right now, this is I think a better appearance uh, for us to talk. Um, it was a great day today. In fact, it was really fantastic to meet people. And one of the things about this show is you, you get this really great um, kind of robust uh, atmosphere to engage um, people that like the same things as you. And I really, really like that. And I respect it. And I just um, think it's fantastic. Um, what I have learned this year, this is my fourth year at the National, is that my bag, as I was saying throughout the week, it gets heavy as I buy things. You know, um, this plastic is great, right? It's good stuff. I'm a big fan of this stuff. Um, but over the course of, you know, nine hours of walking around buying cars and that, and you start stockpiling, um, the bag gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And on my shoulders, it starts to really, you know, weigh onto my shoulders. Um, and so I was changing the bag from left to right on my shoulders because I needed one side to give a rest, the other side to give a rest. But like I said, I'm in pain, but I love it. I love the hobby, and I love all the things associated with it. I'm just a big fan. Um, all the good things, anyway, right? Um, but So I, I keep all the plastic. Um, for re I repurpose it, recycle it through the hobby. Um, all this stuff is very useful to me. Uh, but um, my shoulders, at the end of the day, were like just... I could barely even move. I can almost, almost still kind of hurts now. And I've been out of the show for a few hours now. Um, but, um, <laughs> when I took off my, my bag at the end of the night, my, the actual strap on my bag was like, um, still intact, but it's just pretty, it's pretty wrinkled and, man, thin. <laughs> so glad that eBay provided these for VIPs, though, because, um, there wouldn't have been any way for me to, to, to have my hands free had I been using my other bag, uh, the, uh, of which the, sh the strap had busted out a couple of days ago. But, um, you know, I had a really great time today meeting people and going through their bargain bins and pulling stuff out that I like. And um, I shopped a lot less today. I bought a lot less today than other days because I'd finished serpentining the aisles yesterday. And so now it's going back and detailing meeting people and talking to guys that like other booths and taking pictures and just, you know, doing my thing. And, and so... Um, today was less of a buying day and more of just like an enjoying the conference, enjoying the show, getting used to the layout a little bit more, and just enjoying the Cleveland atmosphere in that convention hall. Um, really had a lot, a great, a great time. I always, you got permission. I always take, ask for permission to take photos, and nobody said one person said no this week of all the people I talked to. Just one guy, and I respect. I was like, no problem. Uh, he does. Um, he creates displays for sports memorabilia for people. Like he sets up professional displays, and he didn't want me to take a photo of his stuff um, because he didn't want his ideas out there. Um, and that's fine. I mean, I'm not gonna get upset when someone says no. I'm always gonna respect someone's response. You know, I, I tell guys when I'm negotiating, I'm like, I'm, I have a number. If I pull some cards out of bargain bin, I was like, you know, I hand him the stack. I'm like, I have a number. I'm gonna respect whatever response you give me. Um, so I, I'm gonna, I throw them a number. And usually we're able to work a deal in some capacity. Like I'll say, hey, it's 40, and they say 50. And I was like, can we meet the middle fit 45? And it's almost every single time it works. Um, so I'm real happy about that. I don't like to underball people. You know, if I feel like something's worth a lot less than they ask for it, I'll just let them know. I was like, you know, we might be too far apart, but it's okay. Like this, this, this might not work for me. And if you feel I can get more money elsewhere, I want you to be able to do that. Um, and I just kind of keep going. Because one thing is like I have to respect everybody's way of being them you know i have to respect their their perspective i have to respect their um ability to stay true to what they think is you know their what they think what value wise what the, what they think is accurate um and i don't ever hold anything against anybody i'm completely happy with whatever they think is best for them and if it doesn't work out no problem i'm happy just you know saying you know no, no problem we, we're too far apart and 
All the best to you. I hope you have a great fifth day. I just go about my business. I have a good time, and it's just something that's really fun with the show is that you're able to um, kind of just walk and think. And I always think about when I go through a bargain bin, and, and it's not really that much of a bargain. And I sometimes like I don't really worry with any intent to like try to help out. It's more like, man, this guy's kind of sitting by himself with all his inventory, and nobody's going through his stuff because it's too overpriced. And I might not know that until I like start sitting with him and asking like see how he negotiates. It might be priced high, but in fact he's really good negotiating. He cuts really good deals. It might be like that. And if that's the case, you know, I wouldn't know until I dug into it. But if that's the case, then good. But if you're pricing stuff too high, um, it doesn't give the market an incentive to start a conversation. And when that happens, you sit on product. So you're there to sell, right? That's your idea. You go to the national as a dealer to sell stuff, not to take it home. Um, obviously, you want to get a you know profit. You're not going to sell for lower than you paid for it. You have to make a living. Or you have to have you have to make it make sense to you. And I and that's how it should be, right? In the free market economy. Uh, you want to sell for more than you paid for it, always to make a profit. I, I understand and respect that. But I also will say this, that if you're saying it's 40% off a of book, and you're going off a of book, and it's 40%, but the card is a beater, beater card, which we'll see in the next in this next portion of this video when I showcase the cards I got. A Munson and a Carlton, I paid um, the prices shown on the cards, uh, 75 cents and a dollar, when those cards should have been a quarter each just because of their condition. Uh, they were just, they were blown out, hammered, and that, this guy had a really cool bin, full of good stuff like that. This was off-centered or just beater copies, but he wanted a certain percentage off of the book price. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, you know, this stuff should be like block prices all the way around for this whole bin. It should be the bin is like, you know, everything's two bucks, or everything's a dollar to two bucks, or whatever. Uh, you know, everything's two bucks, and you buy, you know, six for ten, or something like that. That's how, kind of, I see these things. And you kind of should be throwing stuff in that bin if you're the dealer, like, oh, that's $2, $2, $2. Because um, if you micromanage the pricing like that, it's a lot of work on you as a dealer. It's a lot of work on the customer, too, to start thinking about, gosh, this is horrible condition, it should be a quarter. Well, gosh, this is off-center, it's 6 bucks. Or, gosh, this is off-center, it's $10. You know, it's like, off-center, not off-center. Off-center meaning, like, it's so off-center, you can see half of the next card below it. Like, like that bad. Like, typical 70s stuff. Um, so... I had a really good time going through boxes and, you know, funny thing about the National is that you go through so much throughout the day and the convention is so big, it could take you a minute or two or three to get from one end of the convention hall to the other, right? So if you're going your way from one to the other and you stop buying, look at a, look at a, a bargain bin, and you see something you might want or, you know, you just like pass on it and you want it later, just accept that you might not ever see it again and be okay with the fact that it's okay that you didn't get that one, there will be other things down in the pipeline that you might dig that, that will replace the need for the other card. I accepted this um, like a couple of years back that going to the Nationals is like such a unique experience in that way that when you come across something and you pass on it, be okay with the fact that it's, it's gone. You'll find something else that's interesting in the future. You don't have to go back and worry about getting it again. And if you if you can, great. But if you can't, that's also great too. Just you know, it's okay to let it go and be okay with that. There's you know, something like mentally calming about letting yourself relax and be okay with um, being able to accept loss in a way. You know, accept not buying something, uh, even if you could have afford uh, could afford it easily. Be okay with that um, because. Um, baseball card collecting or sports card collecting is very serendipitous in that way. You don't know what you're going to find, and when you do, you may not want it that at that time. You might want it later. Um, and when that happens, it's okay to like accept that it's gone. It's you know you didn't get it, and that's I think a hard lesson for me in the beginning. A couple, several, like six years ago, uh, was my first national, 2012, and I remember kind of losing sleep over not getting a card. I was like, what are you doing, man? This is a, it's a great it, card, but, you know, you, you don't collect the player. You don't really even collect the set, you know? And so don't worry about it. It's fine. Like, there'll be other cards that are cool coming down in the future. Um, so I, I try not to lose sleep over that, and I also don't lose sleep over condition. Um, you know, like, something I buy isn't... I find a flaw after I buy it. I, I, don't, I don't worry about that. Uh, you know, something like... The, the emotional intelligence piece of collecting, I think, is very critical, and it's one I think is a lot less discussed than probably we should be discussing, um, because it's really important to um, embrace a degree of acceptance when it comes to collecting. And what I mean by that is, is um, 
trying to be a little bit more open-minded with certain imperfections in the way you collect and in the way the cards are themselves um, and trying to just embrace that imperfection and being like that's part of collecting and everybody has situations like that you know like um like we talked about just a minute ago like if you find something you pass on it you want it the day later and it's not it just there's no way to find it you forgot where it was at the national it's okay it's okay you're gonna be all right you know you've already accumulated really great stuff really great items you know throughout the week be proud of what you've accumulated and enjoy and embrace what you what you have um because you know you're a great collector and you know that's 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 a big piece of it you know everybody has their own unique way of collecting i talked about this with a dealer i was like you know it's so cool that every generation has its thing you know my generation now this generation upcoming anyway is like not the current block of time is like rpas and patches and autos and things um it's cool it's like a wave of of theme like you can see that like i can identify this particular block of years with a theme of cards this is the rpa patch jersey rookie auto thick card era you know and so um it's cool i can i can look back and think about this era in that terms just like in the 90s i can think about like you know flashy low serial numbered high insertion ratio type stuff in the early 2000s, it started to become the game used relic, just generic uh, um, um, swatch stuff. And just kind of migrated to where we are today. You know, further back in the 80s, it was like the classic gray back, you know, awesome, excellent, everybody remembers those rookies kind of stuff. So I, you know, every, every, every decade, I would say, has its own theme, you know, and I like that. I might not be into what's popular right now, but I like that it exists. I appreciate it because it adds a degree of diversity and, and, and complexity, um, a flavor to, to the hobby. Like I can go through a box and find some of that, some of the stuff from the 2000s, some of the stuff from the 90s, some of the stuff from the 80s. And it all kind of just works together as this medley of, um, I don't know, community of cards that kind of just works together. And I'll just kind of like throw stuff out um, and, and buy it and like throw them on the table like yeah I want that, I want that, I want that. I pick up a little stack and then... So my next piece I want to talk to you about is, is in the process of buying is that you know quantity discounts can work in certain ways. Um, I was talking to one of the guys at one of the bigger booths today, one of the bigger more well-known established companies. Uh, they, they have a big huge a lot of real estate going on with this one. Uh, great guys though, big fan of their company. And they have uh, ways to draw traffic, really, really uh, very clever way to draw traffic to their, their booth is that their buyer goes out and gets and basically offers uh, stacks of rookie cards. Like one day it'll be um, a stack of Pedro Martinez final edition rookies for a dollar. And then a stack of uh, later in the day at another time, he'll offer a stack of uh, Reggie White rookies uh, for two bucks to get people to come to the booth, right? And that way, instead of just doing like like a year prior, um, they did every morning, uh, you could go to their booth and do the same, and they offered, I think it was uh, John Elway and Dan Marino, um, uh, uh, rookie cards for, I think they were 10 each, if I can recall. And yeah, that's right. And that got them there, but everybody had to stand in line and wait in line for them, right? So in the morning, everybody's waiting and like, oh, it's just showtime, prime showtime, I'm standing in line. So I talked to the guy today about that, that ran that one and then ran the one this year. And he and I both agree that the clever approach to that is to get do those promotions several a couple times throughout the day in blocks, like one at 11, one at two, one at four. That way people can go, they don't have to stand in line for very long, and then they can um, get their cards and go. I thought that was really clever. Now, this quantity discount piece, let's tie that in. So if, if I say, hey, you know, Jim or whatever the guy's name, I'm not going to keep him anonymous just for respect. Say, hey, Jim. He had like say 25 more of the Pedros. So be like, how much for? I just want all the Pedros. What can you do for me? A, a bulk discount. In that capacity, because he's already got them at a dollar each, and he needs them for these promotions. He and I both agree that it would make more sense to raise the price on the quantity because in that case he wouldn't have the promotion anymore. So he'd be selling that promotion idea. So if I said there, you know, if he says they're a dollar each, and I said give them an all for 50 cents, they're like, no, there'd be two bucks each at that point because I'm actually not. You're actually buying my ability to run this promotion. I totally got that. I like clicked. It's like, man, that's, a, that's that's totally makes sense from an economics perspective. So I got that. I understood. I didn't buy all the Pedros. I was like, those are cool. Um, but I just we we talked about that. I was like, what if I wanted all the other? And we discussed this. And I thought that was kind of an, an interesting piece. But 
tying that back into buying on the show floor, I'll pull out a stack. I'll try to build a stack because I feel like that makes more sense to me and it gets more out of their inventory. And so I'm doing them a favor and then, you know, building my collection at the same time. And then I'm looking for like, obviously, I, I, I will always pay what I feel is market value and maybe shave off a little more just as a quantity thing and then try to work with the, the dealer in that capacity, make it sense to make it fair to them. Um, I always try to be fair as fair as I can. That's really important. Cause I want to build those, you know, build those relationships because I'll see them again and, and they might have other things that I might want. So I try to be as honest as possible. Uh, so that's, that was really fun today. Funny thing, um, uh, let's see. We have a, there was a situation today where I wanted to um, see how fast I could go through a 3,200 count box. <laughs> I have this way that, to go through a 3,200 count box in like less than two minutes. Um, I'm real fast. I, I pick out a brick and I go through them so quickly, but I, I want to see if I can get that down to a minute. So I'm working on like cutting down the investment time and maximizing what I can find so I can make the most use of the time I have at the National. You know, how quickly can I go through an entire table of 3,200 count boxes of cards all on top loaders? Can I do that in a half an hour? That's what I'm like, I wanna go through this entire table in a half an hour, no more. There are guys that spend five hours, I wanna knock that out in a half an hour. So I'm trying to work on a system that allows me to go through more in less, less time. I might miss a few things, but the amount of time I'll save to put toward other times is going to be great. Because I noticed today, by, by the end of the day yesterday, I had seen it all that I wanted to see. And so I was going through and I was double seeing stuff, you know. And so I was like, yeah, I've seen this, I've seen this. It felt good to know that I had covered the floor um, before today started. And I could just kind of like go back through and do some, I bought some stuff, some you know, classics and whatever from my classics archive, but uh, for the most part I was just talking and getting to know people, catching up, and I had some notes of guys I wanted to, wanted to check in with. It's another thing too is that, I'm going to show this big, is that um, it's good to take notes, right? Like, like okay, this guy's, this card's here uh, on this aisle. And the guy's not there, so come back in a half an hour or whatever. So take a note in your phone, you know, and, and then go back when you're back in the area. Because um, to keep track of, of where you are is really important. Something about the Cleveland venues that really helped is all the aisles are numbered in the 100 series. Like it's like, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500, all the way up to like 2200. I really appreciated that. I thought that was great. I really liked that. That really helped me out. What I would like to see is the aisles also numbered the other direction. So we got them on the Y axis. I'd like to see them also on the X axis. Now I can see I'm on 200 and 600, like corresponding, or 200B. Probably like alphanumeric is going to be the best, like 200B, 200A. I just think that that would make the most sense. And um, But whatever the case, having just even one row of aisle, one, one block of uh, one direction works for me. Knowing, hey, I'm on 1300 in the middle and people can see up there. I really like that. I appreciated it. It made things really easy for me to uh, when, when communication existed between myself and uh, somebody else that was calling me. So that was a lot of fun. But speaking of acquisitions, you know, let's jump right into it. Here's what I got today. All right, so let's just get right into it here. Um, the stuff I bought today, I was really proud of the stuff I acquired. I had to dig and dig and dig for some of this stuff, but real happy with the pickups. Um, we're just going to kind of jump right into first the 90s stuff. And I filtered it out and pulled out sort of a couple of each thing, some 90s, some vintage, some rookies, whatever. We're just going to kind of discuss things as we go. So two 90s cards I got, pretty low end, but still nice. Another one of these uh, 2000 metal hitting mach hit machines. Mike Piazza. Just didn't, I, you know, I've seen a few of these at the show this time. They're cheap, they're like a dollar. So this is the Mike Piazza, again, with the gears and the cool font down here. Really like that. It's nice. And this other one is the um, 94 Fleer Smoking Heat Maddox. <laughs> yeah, I like these cards. They're cool. Classic staple of 94. So that kind of covers my inserts for today. I mean, I got others, but those are the interesting ones that I thought. Beater vintage category. So first things first, we got Steve Carlton. This is a 74 tops. Look at that. That is just, God, horrible condition. This guy actually charged me a dollar for this. <laughs> he he uh, just wanted to get a dollar out of this. I was like, you know what? Fine. It's pretty battered. This is probably a 10 cent example, but you know, it's one of those ones with a lot of character. Uh, 
just really, really hammered. Rounded corners. It's some horrible surface problems here. Look at that ripple effect. Gosh. It's just an ugly, ugly card. But it's Hall of Famer. So, got that. <laughs> 74 tops is great with the flags on the bottoms and the top. I'm going to dig those. This other one is a 77 um, Theron Munson. Look at that. They got creasing and like gnarled surface issues. Yeah, I paid 75 cents for this. Um, it's because of its character. Tons of character. I really dig. It's sort of like rounded corners. Look at that. Oh, it's the back. It's in such horrible condition. I love it. It's the front again. Tons of creases. Um, just all over the place creases. Jeez. And Thurman Munson's still happy. <laughs> I really love this card. So you have it. This is the 77 Tops Thurman Munson card in hor horrible condition. I think there's some tape up there. Is this a tape? Yeah. It's funny to think about that. Like how much this has been through. The stories it could tell if it could talk, right? This is my battered vintage. My clean, super clean vintage. Let's go to that piece of it. That's a little bit more interesting, right? So we'll start off with the uh, 82 Tops. Ripken Rookie, paid 10 for this one. This is a really, really nice example. Great centering, edges, corners, surface. It's a beautiful, beautiful example. So this will be in my, so go straight to my to be graded pile, for probably PSA. Actually, I know it's gonna be PSA. So just a beautiful, beautiful example. You have two cards that, uh, this, this two Ripken Rookies tops, and you wanted five for lesser condition examples, and he said this one was going to be a little bit more. Uh, so I looked at this one, I was like, well, I can get two lesser conditions, or I can get one really, really clean one. I just figured, like, less is more. <laughs> Coming from the guy who sort of, like, buys a lot of doubles of these classic rookie cards. But, you know, today I just wanted a really clean one. You know? It's just a really nice, nice card. Got Great eye appeal, great centering. I don't know how high this would grade, grade but um, maybe an eight, nine, hopefully. I mean, I don't know. I don't even know what the, how this would how this would turn out. But it's it's one of my better tops, Ripken rookies. It's it's just beautiful. Here's the back. It's a very very clean example. It's a pack fresh. Love love this card. You know, when I was younger, uh, I think it was uh, Christmas of 96, uh, I made a checklist of stuff I wanted to get for Christmas, all cards, all baseball cards, and one of them was the Cal Ripken Topps rookie. Another one was the 87 Donruss Maddox, another one was the 90 Leaf Thomas. And uh, I gave the list to my mom, and she went and bought me the Maddox and the Thomas, and she didn't get the Ripken because she said, when I got to my stocking, which is where she put the cards, uh, she, she told me, she's like, you know, I was going to get the Ripken, but it had three guys on it. I wasn't sure if it was the right one. And I was like, yeah, that's the right one. This is such a great card. When I was younger, I'd always wanted this card. I never got one until, gosh, I think I found one in a bin in 98, and I, I told the, uh, the guys at the shop that there was a Ripken rookie. He was like a du doubled up in a penny sleeve with another card in front. And they're like, thanks for letting us know. And, of course, they didn't sell it to me with the double, but oh, I felt I could sleep at night knowing that they knew. <laughs> Just like the ethical standards of me, I guess. So you have it. This is a really clean example of uh, Cal Ripken's 82 Tops rookie. Love this card. Shows him third base and not shortstop. I think it's really cool. He's awesome. So cool, so cool. This is a 74 Tops Dave Winfield rookie. Really clean. Just really, really clean. It's beautiful. Maybe one of the better ones I own. Really love this card. Uh, this is a little bit OC on the back, top to bottom, left to right, but I mean, whatever. 
you know. I think it'll still be a strong grade if I grade it. So this will go in the graded to be graded pile for PSA. I just totally love this card. Always love this card though. So the edges and corners and centering and surface, everything's very clean on this card too. So I really dig this card a lot. It's so pretty. I have a bunch of these. Mine are all lesser grades, like fours, fives, and sixes. Um, this one being the strongest of the, the, the examples that I own, at least one of the strongest of the examples that I own. I always looked up to Dave Winfield because he was a multi-talented uh, athlete. He was great at a, several sports in college. And uh, just, a, just a great athlete altogether. Drafted by NFL Vikings, NBA Hawks, and ABAs, as well as Padres. <laughs> He's so good at stuff. He was so good at playing so many different sports. Just a natural athlete. Dave Winfield. Rookie card, 74 tops. Love it. So this other one is football. And I like certain football cards from the 80s. I'm a huge fan of... Uh, 86 tops. I just love the design. This is just a. I just love the backs, the yellow with the gray. This is a Steve Young rookie card. If you don't count the USFL card as a rookie card, uh, this is like technically the, the uh, commonly considered rookie card for Steve Young. Really love this card. I have a bunch of these. Not nearly as many as like some of the other players for baseball or whatever, but. I grab them for the right price. This is the cleanest of the one the guy the, of the ones the guy had. He had three of them. The others were just a little fuzzy on the corners, edges, and this one had just better eye appeal, better appearance, edges, corners, surface, which just just looked better. Paid five for this one. I thought that was worth it. It's just a very nice, very nice card. Um, beautiful, beautiful edges. You know, just a huge fan of the set. A buddy of mine, I think, finished the set recently. But uh, I like the green with the track marks. The they go they go along those the the yard lines. It's a very nice design um, that the, the tops came up with back in '86 for football. They're clever, and the colors a colorful um, um, nameplate team team swipe. So they got '80s cards for something. It, I just really appreciate the designs. They're simple, you know. They're they're just very, very classy to me. I just like them. I like the gray cardboard. I like the little things that are said on the back of the card with the stats. A little tidbit bio information. I just like 80s cards. I'm I, just a fan. I look for other sports, um, you know, throughout the show, but my focus always goes to baseball. And when I think about it, it's like, oh, I'm going to look at the football stuff and see how that is. You know, maybe you want to throw some hockey down or look in the basketball, see if I can find some Rodman rookies or something. Um, so, I, you know, I, I did that a little bit uh, this week, but I should probably do some more of that because I enjoy it so much. You know, I like these, these, uh, these classics. Just a, just a real big fan of this stuff. So there you go, this is a really, really clean example of the 86 Tops Steve Young rookie. This will go in my to be graded pile as well for PSA. If this gets a 7, I'm happy. But, you know, there's a chance this might come back an 8. And if that's the case, all the better. Um, so, I'm happy no matter. I, I just think this is a very, very, very beautiful card. Just a gorgeous example. Big fan. So there you have it, those are my cleans and my... All scrappy vintage. So real glad to get those. Now these other cards, these are um, the graded pile. This guy had a uh, this like God, I don't even know how many boxes of uh, graded cards. All PSA. Some were BGS, and they were man. He had orange refractors and back. Some blues and some X refractors. Hardly any base or base refractors. Most of them were like rare refractors. All PSA. See how did it work? He bought a collection from a guy that was the proxy between he and the owner of the cards, who was, I guess, partial owner of the Giants, and he works in Silicon Valley, and he just likes to open Bowman products when they come out. That was at least 
what I got from the conversation. So all the boxes he had were like all the exhaust from the, the opening of this collection, he got all this collection. It's like orange refractors, orange refractors, gold refractor, gold refractor, red refractor, red refractor. Just, I mean, thousands. It's amazing, all PSA. So I went through everything, combed it like a, you know, like, like a, uh, what do they call that? Fine tooth comb, whatever you call that. And I pulled out a couple items, and we'll kind of, we'll start to start like, um, like easily, and we'll kind of work into it, make it kind of interesting here. So the first card I saw was this here, uh, 87 Fleer Joiner rookie and a 10, you know. So this whole stack was 40, 40 dollars. I thought it was fair, but this one was kind of a throw in. I mean, whatever. I didn't pay a lot for this joiner. Joiner is not very expensive, as you know, but it's a classic uh, card from the 80s. And this wouldn't be a card I'd pick up in the commons box for a rod, pass by it. But getting a gem at 10 example is a nice ad. And I've always liked the 87 Fleer design with the gradient blue to white. I've always been a fan of that. I think it's a favorite among many collectors. Probably you, you you know, probably you like it too. Um, if you don't know Biggie, I've just have been a big fan of this uh, 87 Fleer set for a long, long time. I remember back in like, gosh, 92 maybe, maybe, no, it's got to be in the late 80s, 89, 89 or 90, right in there, I'd say. I used to go to my buddy's house and we'd, you know, just... Uh, we watch like scary movies or whatever and uh his older brother collected this stuff 87 Fleer and 88 Fleer and he had like sets and unopened packs and had loose cards and I remember he took me in his room once like we had to get something in his room I can't remember what and I looked around and he had stacks of the 87 Fleer run and I was like shocked because at the time I couldn't afford it you know I was getting two bucks a week for allowance and this stuff was just way out of my budget and I always looked up to it because all the cards, the base cards, were always really expensive. Like Pocket was a couple bucks, you know, B Bonds was quite a few do dollars, uh, you know, S Ryan Sandberg was big, Tony Gwynn, Cal Ripken, Nolan Ryan, those were all big cards in the set. Uh, Wade Boggs, Kirby Puckett. I mean, it's just like really cool to see that that was the case, but I remember being in awe, going to his room and seeing all the 87, 88 Fleers that he had. I just couldn't afford that stuff. I always looked up to owning it, so... Here I am many years later and getting this Wally Joiner in a 10 and bringing it home. It was awesome. It's a nice little ad here for me. I always liked this card, a young picture of Wally Joiner. Gosh, he was such a prospect in 87. Man. I'll always, you know, remember Joiner as that guy in 80s that was super hot. This was like very early prospecting for my collecting career. I wasn't a prospect, but I remember the hype around Wally Joiner. So, there you have it. 87 Fleer Wallet Joiner Rookie Card and PSA 10. This one, 89 Upper Deck. Um, Sandy Alomar Jr. PSA 10. Remember in 89, Sandy Alomar Jr. Rookies were, they were a hot commodity. Tops, Don Russ, those were the ones I was getting. Those are the ones I could afford. Um, so, I, I don't think I got this Upper Deck card in raw condition until many years later. And by that time, it you know was very affordable to get. It was in bargain bins. So when I saw this, I was like, "Oh, that's cool! Like, that's kind of a nice, nice little ad." I uh, really like this this design here with the, the track marks down the side with the, the baseline. I like this rookie logo. It's just it's nice. The star with the little ribbon next to it. This is cool. Big fan of this. Man, what a great set. The inaugural set of uh, 89 Upper Deck. Now, what I've heard about these holograms back here is that um, the hologram can have an impact on your final grade, depending on how centered that uh, that box is within the frame of the, of the diamond. Don't quote me on this. This is just what I've heard. Uh, that the hologram impacts final grade. One guy, um, I, I watched his video, he submitted like something like 40, 30 or 40 Griffies, and most of them came back sixes, and he got one ten, like two nines, like two eights, and everybody else was sixes. It's got to be because of the hologram. I can't imagine what else it would be to cause that low of a return um, a ratio for, for high grades on the card. I mean, even like hard to get eights, you know? So this is cool. This is a 10... 89 Upper Deck, Sandy Alomar Jr. Rookie. 
Love that. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. This is an 87 Donruss David Cohn rookie. So this is cool. This shows Cohn in a Royals outfit. And his tops and Donruss rookies, uh, rookie cards are depict, they depict him as, as a Met. He's a Mets. And so I always thought that was cool that this is the only David Cohn that showcases him as, as a Royal. Um, Tivetti didn't have an 86 card that was produced as a major licensed product, like a 86 Tops traded or something. I just thought that would have been kind of cool to see. I always like this card. 87 Donruss is a really great design with like the tire track marks with the baseballs. Kind of go across the, the, the from left to right. I always like that. One thing I look for though is the centering of the, 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 the line. The card is cut where the baseballs are cut exactly in the middle of them. And on both sides. I look for that with 87 Donruss. I'm very particular about that. So if it's like a 10 and it doesn't have that, it's like you know slightly off centered. I might not be as interested. But this one is a very, very nice example. This is a very clean, nice example. I mean, it got a 10 for a reason, but, you know, sometimes you find a 10, it's a little OC left to right, maybe even a little bit top to bottom. And, you know, it kind of hurts desirability, at least for me. Like, I want a very clean 10. I want it to represent a gem mint card in every way. But I saw this, I was like, cool. This is in the bargain graded pile. I'll add it to my stack. Next up, we got a um, 90 Leaf John Allerud in a PSA 10. I've always liked Allred. It's an important card to my youth. Um, always wanted this card when I was younger. It wasn't until later that I got one. Now I have a bunch of them. But when I saw this in the bargain graded run, I was like, oh, cool. I'll, yeah, I'll check this out. Add this to my pile. I really like this card. So cool. He always wore a helmet, even when he was playing... And, you know, when he's, he was anywhere, like, um, out in the field, he'd always wear a helmet. And, uh, yeah, show him there. He's wearing a helmet there. It's like a helmet hat thing. It's really cool. Played six games with Toronto in 89. It's a very short-lived year. But... I always like this card. It's great centering on this one. When I first saw it, I thought there was a little bit of yellowing along the edges there, but it might have just been the lighting because from this lighting, it looks fine. Even without the, when I like tilt it any which way, I'm able to see a little bit better. It looks, it's, it's a nice one. It presents well. Great centering. So you have it. This is the 1990 Leaf John Allerud rookie in a PSA 10. Cool stuff. Moving on. Uh, you might remember, uh, well, let's see, a podcast that talked about this card. Uh, Fernando Martinez um, I found another red I've got now this is my second red of five this guy that had all these graded cards he had this red so now I've got two of the Fernando Martinez reds and believe it or not as I was digging through there was another red <laughs> so I bought them both I was like wow now I have three of the five reds of this card I'd love to find the other two and have the whole Full print run of the card. That would just be the coolest thing. Um, so, you know, kind of cool to think about. Uh, this card was, at one point, probably worth quite a bit of money because a Super Fractor was sold for, like, something like $7,353 or something like that before the before the Steven Strasberg, you know, craze in 2010. The Fernando Martinez Super Fractor of this card was the, the highest sale recorded. Um, and then it was a Steven Strasberg, and now countless things have obviously surpassed. But it's just the nature of kind of the trends of where things go. So this guy, he was a big prospect in 07, and within two years, he just kind of fizzled, and his career sort of ended abruptly. Um, yeah, you know, prospecting is risky, but, you know, I mean, as a collector, you just kind of got to find something that works for you, and that might be prospecting. There's no wrong answer to this sort of thing. You just got to embrace what you love, what you like, and just kind of go your way and, you know, just enjoy. Enjoy stuff for they, for what they are. Have a great time. Collect what you like and, you know, have fun with it. shouldn't be work. It shouldn't be stressful. It should be really re relaxing, kind of a getaway. So this is uh, 2 of 5 and 3 of 5 in the print run. 
I don't know what the one I have is at home. I'd have to, to pull it out, put them next to each other. I'll figure that out when I get home. So these are cool. Really, really proud to have these in the collection. I was glad to get this stack for 40. This is a nice ad. We've got the two Fernandos, Allerud, the David Cohn, the Alomar, and the Joiner, all for 40. And I think that having these four cards, they were this, they're going to make nice additions to my gallery. Uh, because I'm real picky. There was a Matt Williams uh, 88 Fleer and a 10. I, I decided I, I passed on it because there was a some kind of a spot on the card, just a, an unpleasant appearance. I just passed on it. it wasn't a big deal. I could find another 88 Fleer in Matt Williams if I was dying for it, but I'd prefer to have the 87 Fleer in a 10, 87 Fleer update. I just prefer that card. 87 stuff for Matt Williams is more of my style, but I thought that was a good deal for these, you know, the bargain bin stuff. Just real happy to get those in the collection, so that was, that was a fun day. I brought this box this time because my binder filled up after day three, and so what I did is I, I, I got this, I brought a box, and then a gentleman at the show actually gave me this box when I was buying from him. He has this whole spread of, of cards like on this table, just boxes and boxes and boxes. He's like, you know, let me know if you need if you get a stack going, I'll give you a box. I was like, great. I'm probably not gonna need one. He's like, yeah, I've heard that a million times, and they always need boxes. I was like, okay, no problem. So I check out, and he gives me a box that's kind of short, and then it kind of fills up. It's kind of like you know one row, and I can't put anything else in, like one little stack. And I was like, hey man, can I swap this out for a longer box? And he's like, sure. So he gave me this. So what I do is, to conserve space, is, um, and the box is like really rigid, it's like brand new. So I'll take the cards out of the top, like the top loaders here, these guys, and I'll put them in the penny sleeves, and stick them in the box. That way they're secure and safe, so that if I'm traveling, they stay intact and they're not moving around. And, uh... I can like reuse the, the plastic for whatever again if I want, recycle it through, you know, or some other magnets. These magnets, they're just heavy, you know, my shoulders are sore. So there you have it. That's uh, you know, my stuff from day five. I'm, I'm happy with those pieces. I'm real, real happy with, with how everything turned out today. It was a fun day. Um, let's get back to talking. So, you know, I had a great time. Uh, this whole this whole week has been tons of fun. I met a lot of cool, interesting people. I got to take pictures. Uh, I got pictures of me holding the, the, the Otani Super Fractor Auto. I, man, just really awesome stuff. I got to catch up with old friends, and um, I was real pleased with with the outcome this this year. I had a lot of fun, and it goes by so quickly. It feels like yesterday I got here, but I knew the hustle would start at you know 3 p.m. on Wednesday, and it wouldn't stop till like you know. 11, 12, midnight on, on Sunday. Uh, so we're staying an extra night flying out tomorrow morning because um, it's a hustle on Sunday night. And uh, just wanted to take that extra day to just kind of cool off a little bit. But uh, hopefully it's you know still early. I was getting my, my blogging and stuff done. Actually, it's funny. Uh, this year is the first year I decided to just do these videos uh, after, the, after the, the, the show each night and then collect all the content and thoughts for publishing the articles that will come next week on the blog. So if you're watching this, um, all the content that's here on YouTube is on radicards.com, but it's a small portion of the content that's on radicards.com. Radicards.com is full of articles on set reviews and education and um, rare error cards and uh, just all kinds of good content and education there to, to help us become better collectors. Uh, so if you're watching this and you're cu more cu curious to learn more, go to radicards.com and check it out. You know, go through it. You'll see all these videos published uh, and all the articles about the National. They're published there with tons of the photo galleries. You can see all the stuff we took pictures of at the show every day for 2018. Uh, will be a gallery showcased there at the, in the bottom part of the, the article for the respective day's review. I'm uh, really looking forward to, to publishing those. Um, I'll be working on those this week. It's been a great, fun week, and I just God, I love this hobby so much. It's so cool. Um, big fan of just all the different kinds of people, uh, different kinds of personalities. It's all fun. Like You just kind of embrace all the different parts of the ethos, you know, all the different contributions to the hobby. I'm um, just such a big fan, and it was good to bump into some old fellows I had seen in California and talk to them. 
Uh, one guy I thought he had retired from dealing and just hadn't seen him in a while. I guess he's just doing the national and maybe like one or two other things. I can't remember what he said, but he had calmed down quite a bit. Uh, but he was a big player back in 12, six years ago. And um, I said hi to him, caught up with him for a minute. So people seem like they're doing pretty well. You know, the people are, we're all kind of just growing up. Everybody is, and it's, it's nice to see that, that everybody's enjoying themselves still. Great to meet some new dealers and get some new connections and really pleased with the atmosphere. Just had a great time this year, and um, I look forward to doing this again. While I was on the show floor, I was talking to a guy at a booth, and uh, beyond his booth, I, I noticed a big banner, and on the banner was a picture of John Kinsella, uh, the, 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 the character on the plays the dad of Ray Kinsella in the movie Field of Dreams, one of my favorite movies of all time. And um, I was like, that's interesting. And above the picture on the banner said, meet John Kinsella. And I noticed just beyond, inside the actual area that this, this banner was a part of, was the actor, Dwyer Brown. I was like, wow, I gotta go and meet this guy. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. And uh, so I, 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 you know, finished my business at the booth, paid, and then walked over to uh, um, that, that area where, um, Dwyer Brown was was meeting and greeting essentially, and uh, I met him and I talked to him, just you know, see how he's doing, because you know he's that his character is such a big part of my childhood, and it was uh, really kind of a special, it was a very special moment for me because, um, you know that that character that movie is such a big part of my life in so many different ways. I remember being in L.A. and being so broke and depressed and tired in 2012 and I remember visiting my mother in 2012 in September and uh, I, I got that DVD I grabbed it from my, my room and I brought it with me in, in LA and I uh, watched it like what felt like every day for two weeks solid one 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 block of two weeks in 2012 because my I just felt like my life was just not where I wanted it to be it was just a hard hard year for me really hard year for me and so that movie just kept me kept me going because I, I, it kept me young and I, it reminded me of the simpler times in my life and um, life can be hard sometimes and things like that can really calm us down and so this is kind of a this is a, those are touching moments for me man like I uh, find ways to incorporate my, my hobby and my passion into like mental health and those are the times when I really appreciate things like that. So, um, meeting Dwyer Brown was like, it's kind of like a, it's, like a, it's a special moment for me. I just thought it was just awesome. Um, he's, you know, he's a really nice guy and he's, um, I was really glad to be able to meet him. And we just talked just about things, you know, he lives in, in Southern California. I talked about my experience there and, you know, we were sort of, um, uh, agreeing on some of the, I guess, unfortunate situations that exist on the West Coast, and um, but also some of the nice places. Um, he and I are familiar with some of the uh, some of the similar some familiar places, and so it was really great to, to talk to him just as a person. Uh, he's a really nice guy, and he's you know um, he's a professional, and so I bought his book, and uh, he signed it for me and uh, took a picture with me uh, holding his book next to him. It was just a really cool experience. It was a, just an awesome, awesome finish to the day. That was the, really the last thing I did on day five before I called it a day. Um, day five was just a great, great show. What a, what a great way to end um, my 2018 National Sports Collectors Convention experience. Uh, really just cool stuff. It was just so much fun. I was glad to meet Dwyer Brown and have all the experiences that I've had this week so I just want to share that thanks for listening thank you so much for tuning in uh, and watching the episodes and commenting I've had a lot of fun reading all the comments you guys are so cool uh, I look forward to reading more and um, getting to know some of you so thanks so so much all for all of you that, that met me at the show and came up to me and said hi really appreciate that um, it's great meeting you in person I'm so glad we got in touch and um, I wish you all the best this year in your collecting pursuits Thank you for tuning in to Radicars TV on radicars.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno, and until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting. <laughs>